well, uh, it's time to read books. That's all I can say. Report from the front lines. Dragonflight. Dragonflight. Prince Valmar is looking for an exceptional death knight to travel into Dragonflight. Northrend's frozen central plain and lead an elite cavalry of soldiers in a strike against the Red Dragonflight. Your training is nearly complete, he said in a recent public address. The time has come to strike against those who would protect the living. We shall show them the true meaning of Dragonflight. Alex Straza, Red Dragon Queen, and arguably this crew of this current's most powerful enemy, Northrend, has been seen building up her own army as plate. Though it's assumed that her efforts are aimed at the road Under City. Uh, yes, I read that already. This is Eastern Kingdom. This is Western Northrend. Western Northrend. Reports from the Aerial Surveillance Squadron in Ice Crown Glacier show that communication with the Lich Lord. Chill winter has been cut sharply cut off. Chill winter was last seen piloted to Necropolis, Tower Hamas, over Borean Tundra on a confrontation mission. Reports Coach Engineer Carl Wallen, the squadron's chief information officer. Our diagnostics show that his communication crystals are fully operational. It's just dead silent. Compendium of Fallen Heroes. I've already read that. I have, yes, indeed. A one truth in undead. Behold the finest of enemies. Yep, I've already read that as well. Touch of the Banshee, I've read that. Ooh, Prince Kelsey. Okay, I've read that. Uh, right. This is the Decree of the Scourge. Oh, I don't think I've read that. The Decree of the Scourge, Chapter 1. By Kelthuzad. The roots. Uh, I hope you didn't hear that. The roots of the scourge are soon in the folly of all races. Our rise to power is the product of the sins of those who made our end. The so-called heroes of the land fall before us by resorting to the measure of our ideals to bring forth their mission victory. Their victory is a vehicle the realization that without resorting to what they define as the plausibility to achieve it, we would have overcome them instead. In both outcomes, win or lose, the scourge invariably wins. When this is recognized, submission to our will is inevitable. The master, our lich king, was born under this very same doctrine. To conquer is to corrupt. To corrupt is to take what it is to be righteous and hopeful, to be living, and invert it through any means in your arsenal. The attributes of the living all have synonyms with fatal flaws that are their undoing. Hope is dogma, righteousness is zealotry, living is empathy. Recognize what makes that which lives desire to live and turn it upon itself. Knowing the most direct path of corruption is the pinnacle of wisdom. A simple weakening of the heart, dismemberment of vital organs, or direct disease will work for most. However, the conqueror of most is not the decree of the master, but the conquered of all. It is foolish to spend excessive resources in warping the mind of a simple peasant where a common plague will suffice, but it is equally unwise to try the same common plague against the seasoned and hearty. Regimented study of and from formidability will reveal unusable weaknesses. The Decree of the Scourge, Chapter 2. The largest misconception the living have of the Scourge is our penchant for what is considered evil. For the sake of demoralization, we allow this error to perpetuate and indeed spread in on our own. The true nature of the Scourge is our transcendence of the shackles that keep any of the living races from becoming as prosperous as we. For example, what benefits do emotion and honor really hold? They serve to validate the living, to make them feel good. Now, what flaws do they hold? 
emotion is directly correlated to the influence of logic and reason. Honor is at most times the sole perpetuator of uh, able resources fighting a losing battle. It is baffling, even to me, that the living can be so unaware of how eager we are to play the part of their villain to nurture their greatest flaws by becoming the embodiment of all that incites irrational behavior. Moral ambiguity cannot be cleansed. Antipathy cannot be healed or assuaged. assuaged. Greed cannot be dispelled and wrath cannot be cured. We choose to be the embodiment of all these things and yet there are some still remaining to believe that the scourge can be defeated and removed completely. So long as uh, the most attractive sins of the living remain our pan and flag, there will always be those eager to flock to our will. I myself as well, and then this talk from you. The Decree of the Scourge, Chapter 3. The Scourge is infinite in potential. We are not, however, infallible by any means. Always be well aware of your limits and the resources at your disposal. Always have an exit strategy. Sacrifice of eager minions to your ends is a cornerstone of Scourge philosophy. All manner of bravery, martyrdom, or compatriotism for anyone but the master is imprudent and severely punishable. Another fallacy outsiders hold of the Scourge is that our power resides in the residual will of the living. That we are an advanced form of parasite, and without a host of regenerating life, it simply will it away. Again, we do not deny such ignorant thoughts for our benefit. But this ignorant thought could not be further from the truth. We are nothing but an ever improving form of adaptation to a land once riddled with endless struggle. We are immune to the tradition tribulations of dissension, overpopulation, individuality, selfish opinion, short sightedness, and even morality. We hear the will of the master, and the master brings us all to that we will ever desire. It is true that we take architecture, technology, and physical prowess from assimilated cultures. This, like with so many evil acts of the Scourge, is done entirely out of pragmatism. The Scourge has neither the time nor the desire to generate a future of its own. A member of the Scourge that creates without influence will hold an inherent attachment, a right to see it viewed and used. This leads to individuality which leads to dissension. Let's, let's see, let's see, let's see. Is there gonna be an, uh, a whisper? Oh, there's a whisper. Uh, there is a whisper. No, thank you. Ah. Uh, creativity is a flaw of culture, but a minor obligation when dealing with simple needs like buildings and equipment. It is not your duty to question or care of the origins of your resources, only in how usable they are. The scourge is the will of the land. All manner of life kneel to our will with an ease that yields a single conclusion. That they need us, they yearn for our salvation. There is no resilience our practices, no immunity to our commandments. We are every bit the inevitability that a natural life holds. Death. Death comes with every life, and undeath comes with every death. The sooner the living recognizes this immutable fact, the easier their transition will be. Oh, big book. Uh, account of the raising of a frost worm. The hulking bones were nearly swallowed by the snow, but there was no mistaking the grim claw that jutted upward, twisted in solemn agony. The necromancers assembled without a word, forming a ring around the dragon's corpse. They stood still for a moment as the wind encircled them with gusts of snow. 
Then, the ritual began. Spokes of unholy light emanated from the center of the frozen bones, crackling through the snow and ice until, at last, the immense remains were fully exposed. With a gesture from Grand Necrolord Antioch, the bones shuddered and lurched above the ground, rotating slowly into place. The necromancers' incantations swelled as they began forcing sentence, sentience into the creature's remains. Violent contortions racked the body as the worm's concise conscience. Yes, conscience, my bad, I apologize. Fought against its corrupt reanimation. A thin shriek pierced the air and the beast was subdued. An icy glow ignited within its gaping ribs, a spreading spreading along its limbs and rendering and lending an eerie cognizance to the sockets of its eyes. The Grand Necrolord came forward and spoke. The Lich King has seen fit to raise you to serve the Scourge. You will be our loftiest instrument of death, raining torment upon the villages of our enemies, feasting upon the living, and bearing our finest death knights. The Frost Worm regarded them and dipped its head slightly in accord. The conversation was complete. Rearing back, it fled its wings like a fan of knives across the sky. Do -do -do -do. Okay. There are now Valkyries. Valkyrie. Battle leaders. Square Edwards. What? Siuxi. The Banshee. I no longer train Death Knights, having grown weary of cretinous initiates and their constant questions. I'll be gone. We are done here. Make it quick. The war has begun, says Scourge Commander Thalanor. Death Knight? I shall place upon I shall place you upon my finest griffin and deliver it to death's breach. Chaos, death, destruction. You will herald in all of this and more. Below archers stands death's breach. The staging point for our assault upon the Scarlet Crusade. You are to ride one of my scourge griffins, located on either side of this platform, and report to Prince Valinar. Do as he says, and you may live to see these lands fall before us. There's work to be done. I have death and decay, and I'm gonna put blood boil over here. Whee! This is a really, really swift uh, entity. I have reached Death's re this uh Oh Uh oh, I thought it was going to bring up a Oh well that's uh, my mistake. I thought it was gonna bring up a little bit of uh, things, I guess. Uh, the little map that usually gets brought up. Um okay, I'm not interacting with those unless I um I find myself needing to uh, go back to Atchinus. Oh, rune about caller. Atchinus Jesus. Death Knight Initiates. Fury. Solonar the Horseman. We will take everything from them. Death Knight. Hargus the Gimp. He sells food.
Prince Valinor. stand now, outside of Death's Breach. Futilely attempting to push us back in hopes of saving their horses, mines, lumber, and citizens. This will be your first lesson in Scourge Warfare. Terror! Go to the front lines, south of here, and destroy Scarlet Crusaders. Leave their corpses so that we may utilize them for the death march. But most importantly, kill the fleeing villagers. Soldiers dying are in a fortress, but villagers? That is what strikes fear into the hearts of man. We are done here. Very well. Um, how fortuitous it is that the crusade has a stable full of horses. A mere stone throw from this post. Though they guarded tenaciously, an enterprising young death knight could break through their defenses and uh, take what is rightfully his. Once you acquire a horse from the Havenshire stables, return it to me and I will see what can be done about transforming it into a proper death charger. Remember, Gorduth, it's only stealing if you're caught. Watch out for that deranged stable master. Let them run. There is nowhere to hide. Orithos, the sky darkness. Speak your peace. The sky darkness are mindless constructs with one purpose kill. Specifically, they are aiming to kill any man or woman that they see fleeing in Havenshire for the safety of New Avalon. We certainly can't allow these cowards to make it to safety and then take up arms against us. There is one slight problem. They use satellite arrows for maximum range and damage. Satellite, however, is a metal only found in Northrend, so supplies are limited. Retrieve those arrows for me and I'll reward you handsomely. Frost, Shadow, and Nature Resistance. There's so few items that actually keep any kind of resistance. It's Oh, Gothic the Harvester. Born of the Lich King's victory over Illidan's storm rage in the heart of the frozen wastes, Death's challenge is a rite of passage that all Death Knights must undergo. Seek out other death knights of Azurus and challenge them to a duel. They must accept and fight until a victor emerges. Go now, Godoth. Victory for the Scourge. Victory... Uh, now glory to the Lich King. Okay, I now have my quests. Oh, Azora! And, um... That's that. I've been going to the Nodius, and farewell.